Yes, hello again everybody. I'm Phil Liggett and joined by Paul Sherwin and this is the Opal Coast of Northern France. We're in Dunkirk for the start of this year's edition of the Tour de France. Welcome to our exclusive video here with World Cycling Productions. And the big favourite, of course, is the American rider Lance Armstrong. Have you ever known a bigger favourite? Everybody's picking his name for I think we have to go back to the times of Eddie Merckx to see a man who really is the number one favourite for the Tour de France. Mm -hmm. But Armstrong has changed his preparation somewhat this year, Phil, because he actually rode the Tour of Switzerland before, which he's won. And that is remarkable. I think that we'll see him coming to form in the first week of the Tour. But the last week is very difficult, and that's when he's going to rely on his team. Well, although the race is over three weeks, it starts right here in Dunkirk with a short time trial. And if you bought the video of the Tour de Suisse, then you'll know that Lance Armstrong won the opening prologue time trial of that race, which started in Roost in Germany. So he's certainly a man to beat. But he does, of course, have his challenges. And the one man who is coming to form right on spot, on spot is Jan Ulrich. Jan Ulrich really is this year, I think, better prepared than he has been for several years since he actually won the race a couple of years ago. The important thing is, Phil, that the team actually forced him to ride the Giro d'Italia, and I think that will be putting him in good stead coming into the opening weeks. He's lost a bit of weight, he's looking very fit, he'll be a major challenger. And the one man that Lance Armstrong keeps telling us he fears most is not Ulrich, but Francesco Casagrande. Well, he's worried about Casagrande's climbing ability. Although Armstrong is a very good climber, he doesn't have the punch of a pure climber like Francesco Casagrande. He can explode on the mountain passes, and that's what worries Armstrong. All right, well, the field is here, 21 teams lining up, and we've got 189 riders. Before we go to the action in the prologue here in Dunkirk, let's have a look at the whole route. Now, this year's route, starting here in Dunkirk, is actually the shortest it's been for over a decade. Before you start thinking about digging the Lycra shorts out of the laundry basket, though, I should say that short in Tour de France terms means just over three and a half thousand kilometres. Which, as you can see, makes it the only major sporting event visible from space. Now, after the traditional prologue time trial in Dunkirk, the race circles through northeastern France and off into Belgium for a couple of stage finishes. Defending champion Lance Armstrong and his chief rival Jan Ulrich will be marking each other hoping to keep their teams in good shape for a spot of synchronised suffering on stage six, the team time trial. The big sort out amongst the favourites should come in the second week when the race hits the Alps. The Tour will go up the legendary Alpe d'Huez for the 21st time this year and that will be followed up by an individual time trial from Chamrousse to Grenoble. Then it's down to the Pyrenees, different scenery same suffering, in fact, probably worse, with three consecutive mountain top finishes, which should separate the men from the boys and quite a few riders from the will to go on. For the survivors, there's one more potentially decisive time trial before Paris, and a grand total of 3,454 kilometres in 23 days. Now, the prologue time trial has become something of a British event over the last few years. In fact, we've won four of the last seven, three of them courtesy of Chris Boardman, and the fourth thanks to a storming debut ride by David Miller last year. Well, he's back this year with a great chance of making it two out of two and five out of eight. Yeah, now the prologue's very important. I mean, it's, uh, I got a lot of pressure for it. Everyone's expecting a lot from me, obviously, after last year's performance. And the fact that this year I've been going, I've been so consistent. I've become one of the best in the world time trialling, which puts me as a favourite alongside Armstrong. So it means I'm coming into it this year with a, a much different pressure than last year, it's, which is going to be difficult to say. I, I honestly have no idea how I'm going to handle it. So we'll find out soon enough. Well, the seafront finish line at Dunkirk was packed for the 8.2 kilometre prologue. And David Miller, having swapped his Michael Keynes for the futuristic welder look, went eighth from last. Here's Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin. We are now moving on to a man who won this race last year. It was twice the distance, David Miller of Great Britain, and he held the race lead for three days. Mum's in the crowd, we met her earlier, and I've got a feeling that she'll be cheering. She said all of the Miller names around the course, especially on the whites of those zebra crossings, were written by her in the middle of the night, she said. <laughs> She's a great supporter, is Mum. David out on course, he's been waiting now for 12 months for this moment. It was a real rise to glory when he won the opening time trial last year, but it was a lot longer than this one at 16 kilometres. Well, sadly, David didn't even make it the full eight kilometres upright. Out of sight of the TV cameras, his back wheel punctured on one of the final bends, and what had started as an assault on the yellow jersey became a job of simply finishing the stage and limiting the damage. And David Miller, just four seconds off the pace uh, set by Christophe Moreau. He's now coming over the line, and clearly he has crashed. 
His uh, left shorts there are rolled up, and it's all off camera, I'm afraid. We didn't see the accident, but Miller's hopes now of a yellow jersey in this year's tour almost certainly have gone. There is Lance Armstrong, two times a winner of the Tour de France. Once he couldn't ride time trials, now he is the king of them. He is last to go. Two years ago, he shocked us when he won the time trial stage, and that was the way to the, to the winning podium in Paris. He didn't win last year, he was beaten by David Miller, but the cheers and almost a smile on his face. Unbelievable how relaxed he was looking in the starting gate there, Phil. He's been waiting for this moment as well. He's out on course in the yellow jersey, Lance written all down the centre of his aerodynamic helmet right now. He'll get up to speed as quickly as possible. This man's cadence is unbelievable. He's lost eight kilograms since the rider that he was in 1996 when he was then struck with cancer. He's come back with the same power but less body weight. That makes him a very strong bike rider, especially in the mountains. But his time trial ability as well is absolutely superb. And this is Jan Ulrich, the former world champion of the time trial. He is flying. We've not got a check yet, but we've got Morrow. Morrow has gone through. Second best behind Yargard at the first and only check. One second off the pace. He must be on the best time. Back to Yoshiba Bellocchi, back to Christoph Moreau, rather, out on the course. The man who has set a one-second slower time than Yergaard, who is not the leader anymore and has fallen away from the top seven riders. And so Moreau now is aiming at the time of Gonzalez de Galdiano, and this could be very special. Oh, he hammered it around that corner. That, in fact, is confirmation of the 4.1 kilometre time. Higher guard with 4.34, Moro one second behind him, but the wind has dropped. This man is absolutely flying along here. He's taking all kinds of risks around these corners, too. Bilocchi has gone through in 39th place, eight seconds behind, but he will be very pleased with that because he is a great climber. Christophe Moreau now right down in the low aerodynamic position, keeping the pace exceptionally high. Ulrich Phil has gone through at half distance, 23rd, five seconds off. Well, there's a shot for us all now. We're only waiting to see what Armstrong gets there in. He'll be next to visit the 4.1 kilometre point. Uh, Christophe Moreau might well be doing what he's tried for years to do, and that's win the prologue of a Tour de France. We'll know better when we get uh, Armstrong's time. Here he is in the streets of Dunkirk, heading for the 4.1 kilometre. Oleg has passed through, Armstrong must be there in the next 30 seconds or so. Armstrong will be looking for that time, we'll get it very shortly now, because, you know, this is going to be incredible. In fact, it is just starting to trickle a little bit with rain onto this finishing straight, but it will hold off, I think, huge. until Armstrong gets here. A huge clap of thunder has just come over the finishing line with just a couple of riders left out on the course. We must be lucky now, the rain, if it fell now, will turn this route into a skid pan and Armstrong is closing it down he's gambling he needs to ride three or four minutes more that's all and we're waiting for the next uh, rider to go through that check and it's Armstrong he's there he's gone through two seconds off the pace he could make that up two seconds off the pace of Yargard his teammate and one second behind Moreau and remember Yargard is in and out of the top six and look at the face here, Phil, on Moreau. He knows he's got a chance. Well, for one man, it's all happened today. Christophe Moreau has found his strength in those legs. He's flying up this straight. This is his sixth Tour de France. He finished fourth in it last year. That was by far his best. He was disqualified from the race back in 1998 when he was part of the Festina team. But now, coming up to the line here, Christophe Moreau surely is going to be the new leader. And the only man, the only man left who can reach him is Armstrong. So he could be getting France a first win here as Moreau, sp Moreau sprints up to this line now. He's giving it every out and he's over. 9.20.59. Christophe Moreau is the leader. Only Armstrong can get him. Well, that counts out Jan Ulrich because Jan Ulrich is also pretty high up. He was only five or six seconds off at the 4.1 kilometre mark, but that was a great ride there by Christophe Moreau to go at the top now of the leaderboard. He is such a townhouse of strength. We'll see more about him in a second as we now watch the arrival of the third-place finisher last year, Yoshiba Bellocchi, who won the time trial in the Tour of Catalonia. 
but he's just outside. But even so, fifth place, he'll be very content with that. That's a great bike rider for Yoshiba Boloki. He'll be very happy with that. He's not a great time trialist as we now go back to Jan Ulrich. Only two men left out on the course right now. One is the German national champion and one is the winner of the Tour de France for the last two years, Lance Armstrong. There is the time to beat and it's going to be so close between Moreau, Armstrong and Ulrich. Ulrich knows he must beat 920 of Christoph Moreau and he's well inside the last 500 metres just now. I don't think he's going to do it, but I tell you what, Ulrich is going to be a serious challenger this year. Well, he'll be there or thereabouts, of course he will. His name is Jan Ulrich, one of the finest cyclists in the world, if not the most talented of them all. But he's not going to win this prologue time trial. He is suffering up this home straight. You can see the perspiration running off his jaw as he's now into second place and being counted down. Now third as he comes up towards the line, 920s, long since gone. But look at that, a third place finish by Ulrich. He dug deep, really deep in the last half of the course. Now the question is, has Lance Armstrong done the same? Here he comes up the home straight. Armstrong looking good, completely perfect on his machine, right in the middle of those handlebars, nice and aerodynamic. He will now know the time to beat is that of Christoph Moreau. It's 9 minutes and 20 seconds. Armstrong's face is that of the big time trial days. Just now he's totally concentrated. He's inside 500 metres, going to be very close. I don't think he's going to do it right now. Paul, I'm not so sure you're right because I think he's desperately close to doing it. 9.20 of Christophe Moreau and Armstrong is beating those pedals up the straight. He is going to be first or second for my money, that's for sure. Now, can he sprint it? 9.20 is the target time. I don't think he is going to do it. You're right. He is going to be behind the time of Christophe Moreau. Frenchman has won the time trial. As Armstrong comes over the line, the crowd are cheering because Armstrong is third, 9.24, and that at least will take all of the pressure off having to wear the first leader's yellow jersey. Christophe Moreau didn't look too heavily burdened by the prospect, though. First place for him, with Spain's Igor González de Galdiano placing second ahead of the big two. David Miller, though, was 42 seconds adrift and creating the kind of historical parallels he could do without. Having emulated Chris Boardman by winning the prologue on his debut, he crashed out on his second attempt, just like Boardman. Could have been worse, though. Boardman had to head home in 1995. Miller, at least, was still in the race. Christophe Moreau, though, was in yellow, the French leader for the Tour, which hasn't had many of them in recent years. And the action in the flat first week is traditionally the province of the sprinters, and with sharp elbows, tree trunk legs and loyalty cards at their local A&E departments. And with 20-second bonuses for a stage win, Christophe Moreau, with a cushion of only three, was going to have to work to stay in the yellow jersey. David Miller had more basic ambitions like staying in the race. After a sleepless night with a badly grazed leg, he was hanging on at the back. Ahead of him was 198 kilometres from Santa Mare to Boulogne. But as usual in the nervous opening week, it wasn't long before someone else was depleting the bandage supplies. Italian champion Daniele Nardello down, pretty quickly back in the race. Up at the front, Christophe Moreau's ex-Festina teammate Laurent Brochard was looking to make it a French 1-2 as the race headed into Boulogne. 1,000 metres to go, the last kilometre now for these riders, and Brochard is still holding on. Very shortly, he'll turn into the finishing straight. You know, the nature of this approach to the finish, it is possible he could hold them off here. I don't know if they realise it. It drops down, it's only a 300 metres straight. Pseudo Grady is mixing it to the front there, but they're still trying to come at him. A man who's won a stage of the Tour de France before, and indeed a, t a stage of the Tour of Spain. This is the sweep now, as they line up for the finish. The sprinters are still going to try. Damien Nazel off the right, Baldato in the middle. The Domo boys are bursting out of the middle here, led by Johan Museo. And now they're going to sweep him up on the line as again the lead out now looks like Stefan Westerman has come through off the front. In the man in the in the pink jersey on the right is Stefan Westerman. And also Capel, Ludovic Capel, the champion of Belgium, has hit the front now. This could be a turn up for the book. But Festina are making a big effort now as Capel fades on the line. We need to look to the left of our picture because it looks as though Zarbel is coming. Eric Zarbel, that man from nowhere has just scored yet another win in the Tour de France. That is incredible. Unbelievable. He came here without any team helpers at all. The whole of Team Telecom has been built around Jan Ulrich. He came through that sprint all on his own, completely out of the gap, and he accelerated. What a brilliant move by him. Well, before the race, Eric Zabel had been pretty vocal about his lack of support, but in the absence of Mario Cipollini this year, he established himself as the sprinter to beat, ahead of Romans Weinstein, Jimmy Casper and Jan Kersipu. He also took the green jersey of the points leader, a competition he's won five years running.
maybe I'm the most surprised from all all the riders to have uh, so early the green jersey, and I think it's it's now uh, a little bit amazing for me. So I try to hold. When not, I have a stage win. I'm happy, just happy. Christophe Moreau was double happy. Two yellow jerseys and reportedly engaged to one of the podium girls. What a bad couple of days' work. On to stage two, which took the race into Belgium. 200 kilometres from Calais to Antwerp, which was going under its French name for the tour. Now, there's a time on a tradition that says when the race goes through someone's home region, he's allowed to ride ahead and get a bit of face time with friends and family. The thing is, though, once you're done, you're supposed to show respect for the largesse of the peloton by melting back into it. Well, Paul van Heeft remembered the first bit of the bargain, but on his way back to anonymity, he was distracted by a passing three-man break and decided to sneak onto the back of it. Grounds for a good beating behind the bike shed later, I would have thought. In the meantime, though, the race was on, the break had grown to 16, and one of them was going to pick up a hefty bonus, an Antwerp diamond worth £15,000 was on offer for the stage winner. As the group closed in on the finish, Stuart O'Grady had to be favourite, knowing the yellow jersey was within his grasp and with three teammates for support. And now we're looking at the big, big breakaway here that's got away on pure power today. Four riders, remember, all began when Paul Van Heeft popped up the road to see his family. Then four, three riders reached him, he jumped on the train, and now we have a total of 16 men scrabbling. And in this breakaway is Jonathan Borders of the USA, Robbie Hunter of South Africa, Stuart O'Grady of Australia. And Hunter or O'Grady in a sprint could take it out. 24 seconds and a kilometre and a half to go, one mile to the finish now. Robbie Hunter, no wins this year, injured at the start of the season, has found his form in time to get selection for the Tour de France when he never made selection last year because, again, he was bugged by accident. Look at the driving on now by the Credit Agricole boys. All they're looking for is eight seconds as the attacks are being launched, and I'm not surprised it'll be Mark Vouters who's gone. Vouters, the opportunist, he's done this before in big races, and these are the men who will spoil the day for Robbie Hunter. Mark Vouters on the attack, being chased by Arnold Preto of Festina as they come to the line. This one should have been predicted. Mark Vouters of Belgium getting away. He's being chased by Arnold Preto of Festina. Now, we should have realised this would happen because this is the one man who can spoil the party for Stuart O'Grady. If he gets the stage and gets the 20-second bonus, he will be in yellow tonight. But Robbie Hunter there, you can see, Phil, he's all over the road trying to encourage his teammates to come to the front, but it's a little bit too late. They're going to have to get themselves organised right now. He has a teammate, they're starting to chase down right now, but for the moment, Wouters is looking to me as if he's going to take the victory. He's on the wheel now of Arno Preto, he's just waiting for the moment to launch the final attack. And what a victory this is going to be for him in front of the royal family because uh, Mark Wouters in Belgium is going to be the first man to wear the leader's yellow jersey since Johan Bruniel, and by coincidence, that was also a stage finish in Belgium, and he's done it. So, a great win for Wouters. A bit of a disaster for the Credit Agricole team. Despite having four men in the break, they dismally failed to control it for their sprinter, Stuart O'Grady, who would have taken the yellow jersey. Instead, he came in fifth, and although he had the same time as Vouters, the winner's bonus of 20 seconds gave the Belgian not just the stage, but the race lead, the diamond, and the gratitude of the royal family. No word on the spare podium, girl. And there's confirmation of Credit Agricole's mistake. O'Grady didn't even need to win the stage to take yellow, just stop Vouters from winning it. When I was a little guy, I, I watched uh, every day on to, uh, television and see the riders with the uh, yellow jersey. And, and now uh, I'm uh, 11 years off and yeah, now it's a uh, reality. The next day, it was Vouters' turn to lead through his hometown and celebrate with the family, but he did the decent thing and returned to the pack. In fact, he had no choice because he was dropped on the road to Saran. Stage three was almost exactly the same length as the previous two, but no doubt it felt longer to the riders because it featured a leg-sapping uphill finish. Not a long climb, but steep enough to split the pack, which was more or less together going towards the foot of the climb with the pink jerseys of Team Telecom setting the pace at the front. Let's join it with two and a half kilometres to go. 
it's going to be a big bang when they turn into the bottom of this climb because it's very difficult for 600 meters or so sweeping now towards much closer towards that final corner it's a left hand corner and then the road tilts up very savagely for 600 meters it looked as if Tyler Hamilton was right in there for US Postal Armstrong riding very close to the front right now he will be looking to try and put a psychological advance over Jan Ulrich which is why he's riding up alongside the German just now this is the final corner they are now keeping the pressure high on the front Hepner will be the last man to swing off behind him it's Stefan Weissemann staying very close to the front Andreas Cloden is there the white jersey with the red white red black and yellow band across it is the jersey of the champion of Germany Jan Ulrich two kilometers to go they're now starting the climb and they certainly lost the US Postal boys they shot down the back at high speed as the pace stayed up but they've kept Lance Armstrong up there Hepner still setting the pace in his ninth Tour de France. He won a stage in this race once in Lorient in northern France, or West France, really. 1998 was his big moment as the attacks are now coming. We expected these to be launched one after the other. Now they've got to pay attention. We're on the climb, the two-kilometre slog up to the finish. Little bit of a false flat, halfway up the climb. Christophe Moreau a little further back, the Festina rider in blue and yellow. Fanini Guerini is moving off there now. Stuio Grady is in this group at the moment and he has to stay right there. This is a move by Ibanesto.com. Denny Menshoff, the Russian rider there. Up there as well is Roberto Heras. He's obviously riding himself into form. O'Grady needs to stay in contact with the leaders if he wants to get the yellow jersey. Ulrich now up into fourth place. Fifth place is Eric Zabel. They have still got control. On the front now, sitting high on the machine is Andreas Cloden, keeping himself very much in attention. Right down in third position there is Alexander Vinokurov. There is Zabel. Right on Zabel's wheel is Lance Armstrong wearing number one. And what a win that would be if he were to take out a road stage well before the individual races to come. We are watching a clash of personalities here. There's a bit of pride at stake, I think, as to who wins this stage. There's Zabel. Ulrich is in front of him. I wonder if this is payback time for Zabel because they left Zabel's lead out man out of the team. And now Ulrich himself, a favourite to win the tour, is saying, I'll help you today. It's my sort of finish. Get on my wheel. And that's what has happened these past kilometres. Zabel looking for Ulrich. And Lance, wise as he always is, has picked up the express. Got to stay right in at the front because you can lose time on a finish like this. It's still the control of Team Telecom. This is a magnificent team. 1,000 metres to go. There is the Flam Rouge. Claude and swings off right now, but there are still 14 telecom riders right on the front. Zabel is in fourth place. Jan Ulrich will be the man to take him to the line, and will he offer him the victory? But watch out for Armstrong. When Armstrong gets the bit between his teeth, he loves to win bike races. There's a late minute burst, though, coming from Kelme. And the man leading out there is Kevin Livingstone, the American who used to be on the, Aust on the Lance Armstrong's team, but he's pulled off now as the Kelme rise. Looks like Towel has gone again. This is a huge effort now. Zorba is going to have to make a superhuman effort to get across this. Kelme have made it too soon and misjudged the finish. Vinokurov is now the rider coming over the top here. Ulrich is still there in third place, menacingly so, as the race. Armstrong is still waiting, waiting, waiting as well as uh, Vinokurov makes the run for the line now. This is going to be an extraordinary finish look at the face of Jan Ulrich in third and Eric Zabel is waiting there in fourth place and the pressure is going to come on him if he gets boxed in he has the skill as the line is now approaching what a wonderful effort here by Kelmate now comes the effort by team Bonjour Ulrich is going to have to say to Zabel go Armstrong has gone over the top Lance is on the left now Zabel is coming to the middle the big effort by Eric Zabel all of the work of the day worthwhile you won't catch Eric Zabel now he'll just look at you and ride to the line Zabel wins it on the line and it was a Francaise de Jeux who got second place and so the rider who took second there will have been uh, uh, Manuel it was I couldn't remember his name Emmanuel Manuel who was the rider there who got second place what a win Paul unbelievable beautifully set up by Team Telecom this man has got two stages so far absolutely magnificent but I think more importantly Phil is the ride there by Lance Armstrong for him to be up there in a sprint like this is a serious sign and don't forget that Jan Ulrich was up there too prepared to do some of the spade work for Zabel the real action though was going on further down the field Stuart O'Grady you see there came in with the main bunch getting the same time as the winner the yellow jersey of Mark Vouters though struggled over the line at the back of this group nearly seven minutes down so no seconds to calculate this time O'Grady was the new race leader
In fact, it was a good day all round for Credit Agricole, with O'Grady's teammate Jens Voigt moving up into fourth, just 20 seconds back. After yesterday, uh, yesterday was just devastating for me. Uh, come so close and, and not get it, and I just, I really didn't want to have that last memory for the Tour de France, you know, coming so close and then hitting the mountains and losing half an hour. I, I wanted to give everything I have, uh, all my energy to get the yellow jersey. Stage four saw the race head out of Belgium and back into France. Now, Verdun is a name with powerful historical associations, especially for the British, but its race history is relatively short. In fact, the Tour has only been here once before, in 1993, when a young American won the stage on his debut. Now Armstrong goes on the left of the picture. Lance Armstrong in his first Tour de France. They all said he was too young, but he gets it on the line. Lance Armstrong, the champion of the United States, takes it on the line. That's a brilliant result for him. Lance Armstrong began his Tour career in dramatic style, but nothing compared to the drama that followed. On Wednesday, October 2nd, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Prior to seeing my doctor last week, I had been experiencing swelling and pain in one of my testicles, and I coughed up some blood. On Thursday, October the 3rd, I underwent surgery at St. David's Hospital here in Austin to have the malignant testicle removed, and the surgery was successful. I was terrified. Yeah. A CAT scan was also performed the same day. The CAT scan revealed that my condition has spread into my abdomen. <clears throat> The majority of my disease was, was in my lungs. I had about uh, 10 to 12 golf ball sized tumors in my lungs. I've never cried a lot, but the last, the last week I, I cry all the time and, and that helps, I think. Without knowing it, Lance had been riding with cancer his entire career. His chances of resuming it appeared to be zero. His chances in general, not much better. With what Lance had, almost none. Uh, we told Lance initially 20 to 50 percent chance mainly to give him hope, uh, but with the kind of cancer he had, with the lung x-rays, the blood tests, almost no hope. Preserving his life entailed brain surgery and three months of intensive chemotherapy. Resurrecting his career remained a combination of low priority and faint hope. Remarkably though, 12 months on from his diagnosis, he was holding a US postal jersey in a press conference to celebrate both his return to professional cycling and a year of survival. Having passed the one-year barrier, which was October 2nd, was a big, big day for me and certainly bigger than a birthday or another holiday, and I think that says a lot. Right now, my tests indicate that there is no cancer. The chest x-rays are absolutely clear. When they started with uh, 10 to 12 golf ball-sized tumors in my lungs. And by now, his doctors were happy to come clean about his initial condition and his recovery. The most severe and the most miraculous. Nothing even close. Nothing even close. Lance Armstrong's recovery from cancer is one of sport's authentically remarkable stories. But his achievements since have outgrown the confines of the comeback narrative. If he can make it three wins in a row this year, his place in tour history will be secure, regardless of his place in medical history. There was no repeat win for Armstrong on the road to Verdun, though, not that he was seeking one. There was vindication, though, for another comeback artist. There is the arch over the road. We saw them putting it up this morning, some seven hours ago. And it's the one-kilometre sign for the two leaders, the two survivors of what has been a magnificent day of attacking cycling on the eve of the team time trial. Dirksen's the strong man. Jalabert, the constant attacker, who has won more than 140 races in his career. Now he would love this one. Jalabert, the second biggest winner on the circuit after Mario Cipollini, but it's going to be a difficult one here because a two-man sprint is always a strange one. Jalabert started his career as a bunch sprinter, and these two riders have got to keep riding together until the last three or four hundred metres. There's Mancebo. He is just surviving in third place. There is the main field behind. They're all over the road. Let's not forget, Jalabert needs 25 seconds and the win to get the yellow jersey. Team tactics are starting now. Dirksen's is on the front. He's looking over his shoulder. He he knows the reputation of Laurent Jalabert. He will wait as long as possible before this sprint opens up. It's a day when neither should lose, but one of them will, and Jalabert has got Dirksen to exactly where he wants him. Through the window has gone a yellow jersey, but there's still a stage win. 
They both won stages of the Tour de France before. Jalabert hasn't won for six years. He's about to finish all that now because this is victory for Laurent Jalabert, as smooth as you like. Jalabert goes now for the win, which he has richly deserved today. Dierksens will never master, uh, master this man in the sprint. He gets it on the line. Dierksen second, the battle to third place is crucial. O'Grady is out of it. Damian Lazon takes on Fred Rodriguez. Well, that'll go to the photo. Rodriguez just nipping through there in the last few seconds. But at the bottom of the picture, we noticed we were well inside 10 seconds. So Stuart O'Grady will breathe a huge sigh of relief. But the day belongs, belongs to one of the old campaigners. Laurent Jalabert still has the ferocity and sprint of old. But Dirksensville, he would not give up until the line. Armstrong was much more interested in the next day's stage, the team time trial, where a good performance could put some distance between him and Jan Ulrich. The team leader took control out on the road, only to see one of his team members lose it. And there's a crash, crash. in the postal team, there's a touch of wheels, two riders are down here on the floor, one of them is van der Velde, I think, the right-hand side of the picture, I'm not sure where the other one is, Tyler Hamilton, but two riders are down. It looked like Roberto Heras who went down now, that somebody's switched across there, number nine the going down there, the is Van der Velde, the first Heras. man to go down, right over the top of him there is Roberto Heras, and that was a very hard crash for them, Van der Velde seemed to have lost it, he touched the wheel in front of him, now that is going to be bad for the posties because they've still got around about 18 kilometres to go to the finish line, Van der Velde, the big strong man of the team now, trying to come up to Heras I don't think they'll wait for them right now but this is going to be a very difficult tactical decision for Johan Brunel to make in the team car Team Telecom have got to beat 123.19 of Rabobank and I don't think they're going to do it this is a very long finishing straight Jan Ulrich there is in the white jersey for uh, Guerini the climber is in third place there they're coming up to the line Vinukarov is in this group as well it's going to be oh so very close and they may well just do it on the line oh my goodness me they're not going to do it Rabobank stay one as Toyota Telecom come in just three seconds down officially we round up to the whole second so Telecom are second over the line at the moment now then the big news is out on the course here Lance Armstrong here what's he doing they're waiting they've decided to wait for van der Velde and Roberto Heras they realize that van der Velde is a big strong man they're going to wait for a few seconds they'll lose 25 or 30 seconds with this maneuver but they feel that it may well be important over the last 15 kilometers Armstrong giving instructions slow down let's get back together let's get nine men into this event he's now proving not only is the leader of the team he's the captain on the road he's waiting for van der Velde and Heras has to come back into the group this is a bold thing to do right now but he wants the homogeneity of nine riders going over the last 15 kilometers and this could be a new best time coming up to the line team Kelmate Costa Blanca they've set incredible times out on the course and it should be a new best time well it's got to be a magnificent ride by Kelme today this team that never fails to entertain or surprise they have delivered uh, the fastest times at per, per moments they're still the best time at 60 kilometers and for the moment too they're going to be the best time at the finish superb ride one hour 23 10 is the new best time for Kelme and there's trouble here now this is Bobby Julik here who seems to have lost contact with the team well, that is a remarkable thing for Bobby Julik. He's worked hard for the team over the last couple of days. He was in the breakaway for most of yesterday. And in fact, it looks as if the team may well have actually waited for him because information coming to us, Bobby Julik has just had a flat tyre. So the team have waited for him. They were the fastest team at the 45-kilometre time check, 23 seconds ahead of Onse, and that is going to slow them down as well. This has been a dramatic team time trial so far. US Postal now are inside the last kilometre, and they're trying to drag themselves up the line this is Armstrong on the front the team captain the team leader bringing his troops home after a very difficult course a difficult decision to wait for that crash of Christian van der Velde and Roberto Heras the time to beat is Kelme Costa Blanca 123 10 and they may well push them pretty close well the leveling of the race uh, because now it looks as though Credit Agricola having their problems out on the course and that will level things up a little bit for US Postal who've already had their problems. There's the time to beat of 1.23.10.
surely the Postals have not been able to reverse a deficit like that because Kelmay were quicker by them by just 15 seconds at the last check. I wonder if they've had the strength to reclaim the 15 seconds. Now, they've got to keep five men together here, and the time will stop on the fifth man. It's great that you can finish more, but it's not necessary. The fifth man is the man who will stop the clock as they come into the straight. This nasty little climb as they grind up. Look at the face of Armstrong there now as he drives his group to the line. The champion of the Tour de France these past two years. Grimaces, 1.23.10, I think it's going to be desperately close. We may have a new best time, despite all of the problems of the Postal Boys. Armstrong bringing his team home to the line as he comes up to the line. New best time, 1.22.58. That is absolutely unbelievable. But now we're looking at Onsay, the champions of the Team Time Trial last year when we brought the Team Time Trial back into the Tour de France. Onsay finished all nine men on that occasion. They're shedding a few now as they come up to the line. That's OK. They've just got to keep that vital five together. And they're thinking, of course, of a new leader on the block in Yoshiba Balocchi. This is going to be a great time by Onsay. It's going to be quicker than Postal, too. And I think they may have even pulled away a little bit from Postal as they come up to the line with the best time so far. One, twenty-two, three for Onsay. And that has given them a 55-second advantage over Postal. We're looking at Credit Agricole, who are shortly going to stop the clock at the 60-kilometre point, and they just have with the best time. One, the 13, the 38. They are still leading, despite the problem, to the rider at the back here, Bobby Julik. So that is the best time with seven kilometres to race. This will be incredible if Credit Agricole picked this race up. This is a very difficult finish, as Paul has said, and as you can see, getting a little bit dark here mid-afternoon in France because of the clouds and the rain, which has got steadily heavier as this race is drawn to a close. But Festina, I think, are going to be washed away here as they swing up. There's the Onse time, and wait for it. There's still a long way to climb to the line. Are they going to fall, though, as low as US Postal, who are currently second? Because that's the time they're aiming at now, 1.22.58. They might just about get in ahead of US Postal. Well, that's good news for Lance Armstrong. It means that Morrow isn't getting too far away. And remember, behind all of these names is Jan Ulrich. His team currently in only fifth place at the finishing line at the moment. And they're now in sixth because Festina are second. 1.22.26. The arrival of the Credit Agricole team now, 800 metres to the finish. They've been setting the best time all the way along the road. They're aiming not just to keep the yellow jersey, but to claim top three places in the Tour de France right now. They've lost two riders in the last few kilometres. Onse are in, but at the last time check, they were 30 seconds up on Onse. They've got over their problem because of the puncture to Julik, but now they're rocking and rolling their way to the finish here. 1.20.32, it is going to be a best time, Paul. I can't see them not winning it now. Look at the face of Jens Voigt, this brilliant man in third place. There he is, giving his all. Look at the face of these men, they're like goldfish as they come up towards the finish now. And the yellow jersey sitting on the back, he can do no more. He's given his all now. He's actually going to be the fifth man who'll stop the clock as O'Grady makes the turn into the bend. 1.20.54, they're well inside. This is going to be a wonderful result, and Paul Schoen will no doubt tell me soon that they have got the first three finishes on the leaders on the overall classification. The last a rather slippery turn into the home straight. Now this horrible little sprint up the hill that has hurt so many riders today. As Onsay still on the leaderboard at 122.03. And coming up to the line now, O'Grady follows the wheels, but it's the third man who has to give us the time. And they, he will stop the clock. This has been the finest team time trial ever by Credit Agricole. They've been inspired by the Golden Fleece. They will keep the race lead and with the best time of the day. One, 21-32, simply magnificent. A better performance from Credit Agricole than anyone had expected, including, I suspect, themselves. And interesting to see that even after that crash, Lance Armstrong's US Postal team still beat Jan Ulrich's Deutsche Telekom by 24 seconds. Well, that could be significant later on. For the moment, though, the team who miscalculated so badly back on stage two were doing everything right. A great day for Credit Agricole. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, you know, to win a stage in yellow with your team, uh, that's perfect. And this is even better, a Credit Agricole top three. And although neither Stuart O'Grady nor Jens Voigt is a contender for overall victory, Bobby Julik certainly could be.
We're up to stage six of the 2001 Tour de France. And up is where the race is starting to head. Nothing too serious. That's all coming up in the second week when the riders take on the Alps and the Pyrenees in quick succession. But the race organisers did put in a couple of leg looseners on the way down, starting with a second category climb on the road from Commercy to Strasbourg. Up front, Stuart O'Grady, like most sprinters, not the best of climbers even in top condition, survived the Col du Donnell safely in the leading group. On the approach to Strasbourg, the pace started to quicken, the pack began to get strung out, and everything seemed to be in place for a big bunch sprint. For two kilometres to go, we're on the banks of the River Rhine now. This is a dead straight line to the finish. It is a sprinter's delight, but there is no room for error. You've got to judge it inch perfect. And yeah, there, Dirksen's has pulled out of the way. There's a big long line of Lamprey riders up there as well. Robbie Hunter's in the first 15 right now. I've caught lost sight. There's O'Grady. O'Grady now on the wheel of Eric Zabel. Zabel moving forward, looking for his teammate. Anya Luto is the AG2R rider on the front with a bleach blonde hair. He's looking for Jan Kersipu to put Kersipu in to orbit on the far side there was Cervais Carnarvon they're trying to move their sprinter to the front Freddy Rodriguez Domo Farm Freaks now are sorting out their organization Hunter too close to the front for me right now he's bumping and barging oh and he's almost lost it he's fighting to stay on the wheel of Domo Farm Freaks and that is because Freddy Rodriguez is right up near the front Robbie still a little bit inexperienced there he doesn't want to be second wheel at this stage of the race because the rider setting it is Marco Belezi of Domo and Marco here is leading out Robbie Hunter. Hunter can't afford to come by him. It is way too early here for Hunter of South Africa. He, and he's got no choice now. He's got to grab another wheel as he moves across to the left of the road. Still holds second wheel. He's still holding second wheel, but somebody, he's looking for somebody else to lead out the sprint. And coming forward there, second place there for Freddy Rodriguez. It looks like Domo Farm Freaks want to set it up for Rodriguez today. Right on his wheel was Zanini, right behind him there. You can see the Belgian champion there, a touch for uh, Percy Pook, Kaludovic Capella moving forward now the champion of Belgium and R Rodriguez goes in the center of our pictures Ludovic Capella comes clear now the champion of Belgium launches to the finish this could be a victory for Belgium here he may have gone too soon as he tries now to come up towards line Kirsty Pugh in second place and this is going to be a tremendous sprint now as Auger tries a big match but it's still under a touch of wheels in the middle but now comes Eric Zabel he's in second wheel behind Kirsty Pugh as they dash the line with Damien Nazan trying to take on Zabel as well and Magnon as well on the line it is going to be Jan Kirsty Pugh got it what an incredible position that was for Kersey Poole. He can't believe it. He just shakes his head, and I think he beat Eric Zabel on the line. The second stage win of Jan Kersey Poole's Tour de France career, the first coming back in 1999. No effect on the overall standings, though, as Stuart O'Grady was happily adding to his cuddly toy collection. And after six stages, it was still a Credit Agricole top three with Lance Armstrong quietly flying below the radar, 153 back in 15th place. Now you see, this is what happens when you have digital TV installed. The pictures are so lifelike, you just can't tear yourself away. Or so it says on this script in front of me. Anyway, back in real life, the riders were on the road to Colmar at 162 kilometers, the shortest stage of the race so far. Eric Zabel tried to make it even shorter by cutting this corner and getting a little bit closer to his public than he might have liked. Perhaps he was just trying to get their attention. Up ahead of Zabel, a five-man break had developed and looked like it might stay away from a peloton that was feeling the effects of a hard week. The only threat to the yellow jersey in there was Jens Voigt, and since he was a teammate of race leader Stuart O'Grady, O'Grady had no real motivation to organise a chase. The man with the motivation was Laurent Jalabert, a Frenchman looking for a win on Bastille Day. He gambled nine kilometres from home, trying to lose his four fellow escapees on a descent. But Lise Van Besso fell as they tried to close the gap, and the longer Jalabert stayed away, the better judged his attack started to look. His legs are not strong enough to pedal the highest gear on that bike, although the road is flat, they're so tired after 60 miles in the lead today. But Jalabert is getting ready for the two-armed victory salute, and this will be sweet. Bastille Day in France, and a Frenchman comes home. There aren't many can claim that, and this man will have done it twice now since 1995. And look at the face now. Jens Voigt will get the yellow jersey by a huge margin today. If the peloton stay out at 4 minutes 15, that will take some dislodging and will be a diversion for a couple of days to come, I think. 
but now save your applause for Laurent Jalabert out for the count at the start of the year of the year thinking he'd never race again and now here we are on stage seven of the tour and he's got two stage wins to his name and this one will be the sweetest of his life it also will bring his victory list up to 154 wins as a pro and there are very few riders can ever claim that number of wins since he turned pro in 1989 he gets it the proudest moment probably of his career for Lange Jalabert and now in second place, oh, our camera's going to stay with Jalaba. Well, there are French cameras after all. So we'll have to wait for the arrival now of the sprinter. Jens Voigt comes over in second place with Rue right on his wheel and Cuesta coming across the line in fourth. The main field came in nearly four and a half minutes behind the break. O'Grady was in it, knowing that his yellow jersey was gone. The French couldn't have cared less about the race lead at that point, though. They were too busy celebrating Bastille Day with a third homegrown stage win, the second for Jalabert. There's the result with the escape committee filling the top places and David Echeverria leading in the main field behind them. So O'Grady had lost the jersey, but Credit Agricole hadn't because it passed to Jens Voigt. Voigt had started the day with a comfortable lead over Laurent Jalabert, so despite his win, the best the Frenchman could do was break up the Credit Agricole monopoly by leapfrogging into second. Voigt, meanwhile, seemed a bit unsure of the etiquette of usurping one of the team stars. It's a bit difficult to say because I took the jersey from Stewart and I hope he's not too unhappy about it. And, you know, because he's my teammate, he's a good friend on, on top of it, he's a good friend of me. And, uh, but yeah, still, like, taking the yellow jersey into the front and the biggest and, uh, like, most beautiful race in the world, it's, of course, it's something special. The weather had been poor all week, but stage eight was the worst so far. Relentless rain, sapping the will of the peloton to chase down yet another break. Well, if I tell you this man with 13 others is 32 minutes and 50, that's that 5-0 second ahead of the bunch. It's absolutely true. We are about 61 kilometres from the finish. And Stuart O'Grady, if he holds on to only half of this lead, is going to be way out in front in the Tour de France. Now, at the start this morning, there were 176 riders. Since then, one has retired for Nacciari, so there are 175 riders currently on the road in the Tour de France. Thoroughly miserable day. The peloton was freezing at the start this morning. You can see by the riders here, they're well wrapped up with their long trousers on, which they call their legs and the long arm warmers as well, probably an extra jersey and a racing cape. The attack came after only five kilometres. Mark Wouters, Ator Gonzalez, Nicola Loda, Ludo Dierksen's got away. They were joined by 11 others, one of those, Vinokurov punctured, he went back to the field, but the other 10 stayed there and it included Stuart O'Grady. Third overall this morning, Paul, four minutes, three seconds off the lead. He now leads the tour by 28 minutes as we speak. Absolutely incredible, but I think to put it all into perspective, if you look at the positions of all the other riders in this breakaway, the majority of them are already more than half an hour behind riders like Lance Armstrong. Nobody regards Stuart O'Grady as a long-term chance to win the Tour de France, but certainly if he conserves a large portion of his advantage today, he could be the yellow jersey well down into the Pyrenees, and that's something nobody could have gambled on. And there is Mark Wouters. We saw him win the stage into Antwerp. And uh, that was when he was last in a breakaway, and the reward for him then was a race leader's yellow jersey. He held it only for the day. He lost it the next day uh, as we raced uh, down to Sarang near Huy. But fortunes changed quickly, it seems, in this year's Tour de France. It's a strange mix of riders too, Phil, because of the 14 riders in the front, there are 11 teams represented. The teams who have the best situation tactically are Festina with two men there. They have really the fastest sprinter in the lot, Sven Tutenberg. We've seen him very much in the front of the sprint so far. But tactically, Rabobank must be a lot stronger than anybody else because they have three men in this leading group of riders. Bram de Groot, Eric Decker and, of course, Mark Wouters, who we spoke about just a little earlier. They should be able to launch the attack, so they will want to split this group towards the end because of the presence of Sven Tutenberg. You can see now this is obviously the plan of Rabobank. They knew with a group of 14 they had to split it up, and to try and win they had to get rid of your favourite there, Sven Tutenberg, because he is certainly the fastest man in that group of riders of which have escaped after just five kilometres of racing. Somebody has joined Vouters there right now, and it's uh, probably a 
another Dutchman, and I would say, looking at that jersey, it is almost certainly Servais Canavan, former Dutch national champion. And the of Paris Bay, and this is how he did it, slipping away near the end. Still got a little way to go, 46 kilometres. Time check finally reaching us after all that long wait, and they've taken 10 seconds off the peloton. There's a fight back. It is now 32 minutes and 40. Well, that's going to be a, a magic chase for those guys, and that uh, was, it's in fact, Surveys Carnarvon who slipped across the gap there. A very clever bike rider, Surveys Carnarvon, and it was because of the matching of George Hincapie in Paris Roubaix that, in fact, he was able to slip off the front and get the victory. A good move by Domo Farm Freaks on that occasion, giving them first, second, third, and fifth place in one of the toughest classics possible. The only man who prevented them getting the clean sweep was Georgie Hincapie, finishing in fourth place just a few days after his first major classic win from again. Well, they would know that it would be riders from Holland and Belgium who'd try this sort of a move, and here they are. Now, what are they going to do about it? The thing is, there are so many teams represented back there, they may have a little delay in coordinating a chase down. With 46 kilometers to go, it's a good time to try a move, uh, simply because the boys here will say, it's too early, we won't go for them yet, and all of a sudden, Men of the power of Vouchers and Canavan will be out of sight and heading down to the finish in Pontalia. A very good move, this. Stuart O'Grady won't chase them down, sat at the back here at the moment, because he is still gaining all the time he requires to become a clear leader of the Tour de France tonight. Starting the day in third place overall, just over four minutes off the pace, everybody else except one rider is in double figures and so he's in a very comfortable position as Wouters goes again the kilometer just like he did when he won in antwerp a few days ago and again it is left to Ator gonzalez to chase the gap down so watch out now for the gray jersey of surveys canavan the former champion of holland as he lines up in third place he's got the best launch position but Ator gonzalez surely is the man who deserves the win He's done all of the work, chasing down all of the breakaways right now. It's been a huge battle for Rabobank to try and gap him on the run into the finish. But the man who's been profiting from all of these tactical manoeuvres is Cerves Carnarvon. Watch out for him. They're forcing now Wouters onto the front. Wouters must lead out the sprint for his man, Eric Decker, who's at the back there wearing number 54. This is going to be very difficult. The four men at the front of this race now, Phil, and only one man can win. The flag of Switzerland there to the right. There's no Swiss rider in this break. Away as now it's being forced to be led out by Mark Vouters. Look at the face of Ajo Gonzalez. This is the last kick now, and this will be a most unusual victory for Kelmay. He's taking surveys, Canavan, but he's going to try and hang on here as he comes up the line. Canavan giving his final best bet, but I don't think he's going to do it as on the line, Eric Decker produced the sprint of his life. Well, he produced the sprint of his life a couple of times this season. He did that last year as well. He was so close to winning Tour of Flanders, but there, I don't know where he dug that energy from because he'd gone off the back a couple of times. Quite a remarkable win for Decker as we look at the remainder of the group here. There are ten riders in this group. Stewie O'Grady's there. He wants to get as many points as possible now to increase his lead, not only in the yellow jersey competition, but also in the green jersey competition. Eric Decker, win number four at the Tour de France in just two years absolutely amazing he held on to the end with that sprint he's not a great sprinter but he managed to get just over the top of gonzalez and canavan mark Wouters getting the fourth place the second place will go to the photo by the way with eric decker the amsel gold winner this year and the world cup leader he's taking part in the rugby scrum there right now and just about holding them all off back out onto the course as we see now the arrival of the rest of them andre kivalev with a lot to gain today he's back in the race now we're pulling back a huge chunk of time and of course he's bringing home the new leader of the tour Stuart O'Grady back in yellow after he lent the jersey to his teammate Jens Voigt yesterday well this is Jackie Durant he will try and get himself a fifth place leaping off <laughs> the front of the pack right now Jackie will never give up he will always do his best to surprise the sprinters he hasn't got a great sprint himself and in fact he's forced Sven Tuttenberg to come to the front the Faso Bortolo rider in the white jersey there is Nicolas Loder, but Jackie Durand's going to get himself fifth place at the end of a very long and hard stage. Hey, the sprint is already there. The sprint is starting yeah. behind, though. It's amazing. Jackie Durand, the opportunity, he'll go back on top of the Combativity Prize, which is for the most aggressive rider of the tour, and pull on a red number again tomorrow. It's a prize he's won before, 
as he leaps away from the field. That's the Hult, the other man of the Rabobank leading the round, followed by Sven Turtenberg, Stuart O'Grady, Ludovic Turpin. But I don't think they're going to get up to Jackie Duran now, who's coming home in sixth place today. Very high average speed in the end, 44.6 kilometres an hour. And they pulled out over two minutes those breakaway of four, which is significant, I think. Has Duran just about going to hang on, or is he, as he's being chased down here? Well, he's starting to crack right at the end. That was a long move there by Jackie Duran. That was about a kilometre and a half. It's Tutenberg, your favourite, is going to be oh. the fastest man in the finish line. But sorry for Tutenberg. There were a lot of riders in front. Watch out for Stewie O'Grady. O'Grady says, right, I want these points. points. As many as possible. Fifth for O'Grady. O'Grady and Sven Tutenberg, six and seven on today's stage. And just about two and a half minutes after the first four riders came home. But those points, you know, are going to be very valuable to Stuart O'Grady. He's now the leader of this race in green and the leader in yellow as well. What a race. Of course, with the mountains to come, leads like this for a sprinter like O'Grady don't mean much. Still, to look down the classification and see that you're leading Lance Armstrong by 35 minutes can't be bad for morale. Yeah, I think for the whole team, uh, again, we've shown that it's, just, uh, it's been very good strategy and good team tactics and it's worked out again, so it's good. The race was continuing to head south, not that you'd know it from the weather. Stage 9 from Pontalier to Aix-les-Bains was another miserable one. By this stage, the starting field of 189 had shrunk to 175. Up at the front, three men were trying their luck. Russia's Sergei Ivanov, Spain's David Echeverria, and Brad McGee of Australia, who kicked the whole thing off. The peloton seemed less interested in chasing than checking out the roadside attractions. And by the time they decided to pay attention and work, there was very little margin for error. With nine kilometres to go and the brake in danger of being swallowed by the closing pack, Ivanov decided to chance his leg. The gap is being held here by Ivanov. This will be a tremendous victory for him. 33 kilometres to go. The gap is 38 seconds. They're not closing quick enough. That's unbelievable. This man is digging so deep. He's using a monstrous gear right now. Two kilometres to go. That's around about two and a half minutes of agony for this man. And he will support the agony over the next two kilometres. Echeverria in second place on the road in the orange jersey. They're digging so deep. These men work together from the 36th kilometre when they attacked. But over the final 10 kilometres, they've been not able at all to pull back the advantage of Sergei Ivanov. Ivanov is flying now. He will get morale from the fact that he knows the kilometres are ticking by. The next banner he will see is one kilometre to go around this very dangerous right hand sweep and then follows a dangerous left hand sweep as he lines up for the lake itself this would be a dramatic victory for Sergei Ivanov you wouldn't have given him a chance at three kilometres ago but he has de resisted the chase by the telecom riders and by Bonjour this could turn the look around of Faso Bortolo who's lost two of their riders already in this Tour de France and I'm not sure these two are going to hang on but I think Ivanov has got it he will very shortly see one kilometre. He's still got ten, ten seconds advantage over the two chasers. The wind will certainly go to this man, and what a day it will be for Faso Bortolo. There is the banner he's been looking for, one kilometre to go, a thousand metres. In a minute's time, he'll cross the line, and that will be a great victory for him. He showed us his form was coming, as indeed did Lance Armstrong by winning a stage of the Tour of Switzerland. He's now inside a kilometre to go, and Ivanov is going to get his first victory in a stage of the Tour de France. 115 miles today in less than four hours. This has again been a super quick stage of the tour. He's just making sure nobody is coming at him as he prepares now to salute the crowd. And he's won it, and I bet he can't believe it. No, he can't, but it is his. His third Tour de France. He's never reached Paris, by the way. Maybe he will this year, and if he does, he'll do it as a stage winner. Well, this is the sprint for second place out on the road, and there is the main field. Echeverria has leapt away from Brad McGee. Brad McGee obviously didn't have the power today. Echeverria disgusted in second position, not happy at all, and in the main field behind there's a big charge to the line. At the head of that chasing pack, Eric Zabel just managed to get a wheel in front of Stuart O'Grady on the line, but that wasn't enough to stop the Australian holding on to the green jersey as well as the yellow one. A dream first week for the French team, Credit Agricole, Thanks to all their foreign riders. Oh, it's been a fabulous week. Um, the whole team's just been on a roll. It's just we've just kept good things have just kept coming and coming, and it's been really good. The team's really needed it. It's lifted our morale and uh, team spirit through the roof. And we 
from now on everything's going to be a bonus. Obviously, Bobby Ulick, you know, is hoping for a good overall classification, and you know, if he can do that, then it'll be a perfect Tour of France for us. And that brings us up to date. O'Grady, as you can see, isn't just leading the tour. There's only one rider within 20 minutes of him. The big names, though, are all lurking on page two, waiting for the mountains. And really, the gap to pay attention to isn't the 35 minutes between Armstrong and O'Grady, but the 27 seconds between him and Ulrich. Now, the first mountain stage of the tour is important psychologically as much as anything else, a chance for the serious contenders to make a statement of intent. And as anyone who studied the form book on Lance Armstrong will know, He's got a bit of previous in that department. Two years ago, Armstrong was already in yellow by the first mountain stage and disabused his rivals of any notion of taking it off him with a stunning attack on the road to Sestriere. Last year, he used the first big climb to take the jersey, leaving Marco Pantani and Jan Ulrich behind him on the slopes of Otakam in the Pyrenees. So one thing he wouldn't have on his side this year would be the element of surprise. If you look at the last two years, 99 and 2000, on the first mountain stage is when we made our move and took the jersey or, 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 or made the, the lead bigger for the yellow jersey. So I'm, sh I'm assuming that this year everybody will sort of look to the first mountain stage to Alpe d'Huez uh, for us to try a similar tactic. But again, we can't say that, we can't promise that, and we can't practice that. That just those are real-time decisions, and you have to look around and see what the others are doing. If you have that opportunity, then you take advantage of it. If everybody else is great, then you can serve and wait till the next day, the uphill time trial. Stage 10 wasn't a time trial, just a trial, and these were the hills, the biggest of them, the Col du Madeleine, topping out at 2,000 metres. By the time he got there, old poker face was wearing an uncharacteristic grimace, hanging on at the back of a group, being driven by Jan Ulrich's telecom team. And having been given word that Armstrong was apparently struggling, they drove on all the faster. I'll give you the passage over the top of the Col de Madeleine. It's now been confirmed. A winner for Long Rue, uh, followed by Eladio Jimenez and Antonio Taula at 3 minutes 10. Then at 8 minutes 20 came Laurent Jalabert, Stefano Garzelli, Michael Bogart of the Rabobank team, Sevilla, Belli, Van der Vauer of the Lotto team, Atienza is also up there. Ulrich, Clouden, Vortus went over the top in a high place, Botero and Livingstone. They were the leaders over the top in that front bunch, so Armstrong didn't take any part in the sprint for mounting points, but he is very much in that group we're watching now here as we go through La Morienne, heading towards the start of the climb of the Col de Glandon, especially for this group. The leaders are on there. through the inside of the roundabout as we course through a little industrial area here in the Alps before we go up the big climb of the second climb of the day. Well, the profile today doesn't give the riders much respite between the climbs and the descents. In fact, they've only got around about five kilometres of flatlands before they start climbing again. That big slope of the second climb of the day, the Col de Glandon. The Glandon climbs up to 6,312 feet, and that is after starting at 450 metres. It's an awful long ascent. These riders facing a long, tough day in the saddle. A little bit of discussion at the back here. These are the two US postal riders. This man here is Jose Luis Rubier. Armstrong was just in front of him and quite a few riders from Lotto have managed to make the junction as well Stefano Garzelli is in this group for Mape and this is the chaos at the back of the main field the group of all of the big favorites right now what is happening is they're trying to take on board as much drinks and extra food and carbohydrate drinks as possible over this flat five kilometers because it's so very difficult and dangerous on the slopes of the climbs that's Lely there in the covered his colors this is Kevin Livingstone, he seems to have had a good day today, he's had a few rocky ones uh, throughout the first week of the tour, but he's come good at exactly the right moment, and Vortas almost touched the Americans' wheel there. This is dangerous, this is chaos at the moment, you've got five kilometres, which is around about seven or eight minutes to get back to the team cars, get on board as much drink as possible, then ride straight up through the field and distribute all those drinks to your team leaders, which is what our man just now is doing, Kevin Livingstone. Vortus is having a great tour, really. It's a pity he's lost so much time over the first flat stages, but he now is going to have a serious chance at showing his climbing ability. He's a brilliant bike rider in the mountains, and he may well be nurturing now hopes of a good performance in tomorrow's individual uphill time trial, a time trial that Lance Armstrong feels that he will be the top man for. But we've still to see Armstrong at the front of this group. 
And Vinukarov here doing his work because I fear he might be going off the back. Or is this Hepner's come back? Well, Hepner came back then on the valley descent, so another man has come back alongside Jan. And that means he's got another pacemaker, at least for the early slopes of the climb of the Glondon. Interesting. Hepner must have made an unbelievable descent to pull himself back into this race. He was in difficulty there over the slopes of the Col de la Madeleine, and now he will ride as hard as he can on the front of this main field to take them through the sign indicating 20 kilometres to the summit of this climb. The main field now with all of the favourites are facing a 12 and a half mile climb to the summit of the second climb of the day, the Glandon. The slate grey roofs of the houses which nestle at the foot of the Col de Glandon. 20 kilometers now to the summit as we climb out of the valley and up over the top of the mountain this is the tour de france today and it has been a superb day of racing so far about 50 riders are surviving in one group chasing those three men two and one is their order on the road we've just heard a call on the race radio saying that lance armstrong has gone back to his team car we haven't seen any pictures of that but it's just happening as we speak while we look at the head of the peloton here and Jens Hepner, after a great descent, has rejoined the leaders and he is a teammate of Ulrich and he's setting the pace right now. He is the sacrificial lamb. Here we are at the back now with Armstrong. It looks as though Rubiera has waited for him, number eight, and taking him back up to the race. And Atienza is the Kofidis team. You know, Paul, Kofidis have got a lot of riders here. Atienza, Questic, Kivilev and Lely. Well, this is a team that had their Tour de France turned upside down when they missed the vital breakaway on the stage to Verdun. They all lost 18 minutes, and now the Tour is bouncing back to them. Armstrong right now looks fairly concentrated. He's actually playing around with his uh, race radio at the moment. He wants to be totally in communication with Johan Brunil. Rubiera up alongside him, a quick chat to see how Lance is doing. He looks concentrated now. He was in difficulty on that first climb of the day, but this is certainly a very tough day for all of these bike riders in the mountains. It's a 209 kilometer quick chat there. That was a check to see if Armstrong's radio was working. There's something, it seems as if Rubiera is trying to tell Lance that the radio is broken. We'll try and listen in there. It's amazing the technology of these guys right on the SFP. Well, uh, Riviera is learning English. I'm not sure how good his English is right now. But anyway, they shouldn't allow radios in the tour as far as I'm concerned because uh, the riders should be allowed to ride their own race and not be told what to do by the team. Um, because I think it ruins much of the action. Paul doesn't agree, do you, Paul? I don't agree with you there, Phil. <laughs> I think we have to go with the moves and the advances in technology. Just think, when I covered the Tour de France for the first time with you, you used to use a typewriter. <laughs> oh, well, and you wouldn't you be anywhere Touché. nowadays without your computer, <laughs> would you? No, I wouldn't, that's for sure. Uh, but I still push the buttons around, they're pretty simple. just don't make any noise anymore. Team Telecom there, Phil, really getting the big advantage, the tactical advantage right now, but look at the mountains that we're going into right now. This is a very long stage for these bike riders, you know, and they have got a lot of hard peaks to go over. They started off the Col de Fren, that was only 950 metres, but the first big climb of the day was the Col de la Madeleine at 6,500 feet, following that with the Col du Glandon at 6,300 feet. Absolutely remarkable work to put in, and then finally, the last climb of the day that the riders have to drag their bodies over is the Alpe d'Huez. That is an unbelievable 6,070 feet with 21 horrendous corners, and that is what all of these riders will be thinking about right now. Well, we've been climbing now for three kilometers, and it's three fifty. It's no, it's 4:15 back to Antonio Tala now, and just under eight minutes back to the group, which is being driven now by five riders on Team Telecom, including Jan Ulrich. On this climb, when it starts to really bite, I think we'll lose Vinukarov and also Hepner, and then it'll fall to Cloudon and Livingstone to keep uh, Ulrich right at the sharp end there. And Lance Armstrong is going to have to use his riders as best he can uh, to stay in touch with the Telecom boys. Well, this is a very select group. Daniele Nardello is there in the Italian jersey. He's also riding well. Well, in fact, a quick look there. You can see one man has returned into the group, 101. Bobby Julik must have come off that mountain like an absolute and utter maniac. We never got that information on race radio, but there he is for confirmation. 101, Bobby Julik has ridden himself back into form, and he must be breathing a serious sigh of relief right now because he thought his Tour de France was absolutely disappearing from him. 
So the group has uh, strengthened a little bit on the way down. Good for Bobby Julie getting himself back to. He may well have come back when Jens Heppner came back. And they've got a few more riders up here now. The pace, uh, very familiar pattern, is as it was on the climb of the Madeleine. We're now seeing uh, the Telecom riders here uh, keep Ulrich right on. And Ulrich has looked so strong today. This is going to be a big showdown on the Alp. Ulrich wants to prove that he's the best bike rider in the world. He's had a magnificent performance at the Tour de France over the year with one victory and three second-place finishes. The first second-place finish was in the first year that he actually came to the Tour de France. And I have a feeling having Kevin Livingston alongside him is a serious advantage. They want this race to be as hard as possible, Phil, before we come up to the final climb of the Alpe d'Huez. They've got rid of most of the riders who were in that early breakaway in the Tour, which gained 34 minutes over the main field. Riders from that group who have disappeared are O'Grady, De Groot, Sven Tutenberg, Jens Voigt, Ludo Dirksens, Wouters, Turpin, Aitor Gonzalez, on the other hand, who was in this main group right now, is a man who certainly will be looking to ride himself higher into the standings. Laurent Roux making the most of the drink, that's the secret, little and often on conditions like this, so you don't dehydrate at all. Angle Casero is also off the back now of this group we're looking at. So the former champion of Spain again in difficulty, it's still a very big group this, oh no, even worse, he's abandoned at the moment. So Casero has abandoned the tour, that's our third abandon of the day. Well, that's a surprise because Casero is a very good bike rider. We've seen him ride excellently in the Vuelta a España. It gives you an idea of just how hard this first 10 days of the Tour de France has been, especially with that very long, hard day in the bad weather a couple of days ago, which saw a group of 14 riders finish 34 minutes ahead of the main field. And although you think that that's a, a huge time loss, the peloton were actually riding on the normal schedule for the day it was in fact the leading group of 14 who ended up being 20 minutes up on schedule and being dropped slowly is Antonio Towler from that front group and here they pick him up so Towler having been away since kilometer number six today as we come towards the top of the Col de Glandon still a little way to go he is now back in the peloton and he's gonna have to hang on still complete control of the front of this group is coming from Team Telecom. Towler has just been caught and he's slipping his way back down the group. He'll hope that he can stay in contact. Looking down on the bunch now as news reaches us with the abandon of the former champion of Spain who was in this group, Angel Luis Cathero, has given up. So he's our fourth name of the day to drop out. Joins the champion of Belgium, Capel. Ex-champion of Belgium, Steels, and the former champion of uh, Latvia, I think it is, uh, Kersipu. So they've all gone today, and now we're looking here at the principal group. We're just sitting at the back is Walter Beneteau uh, for Bonjour. Done a good ride so far. Let's hope we can keep it going. Towler has just been picked up, and he's now back in this group for the moment at least. There's the latest. Six minutes 40 to Botcherov, who is now third on the road, and another 20 seconds back to this big group, we are looking at here. The rider there with a pink stripe on his shorts is a former world champion, Laurent Brochard. He too was dropped on the previous climb of the day, the Col de la Madeleine, but he made a daredevil descent to reintegrate the leading group, which at the moment is really swinging over to the advantage of Team Telecom. The big advantage Team Telecom have on this stage, Phil, this mountain stage today, is that they've got nearly all of their riders on full, complete, and all firing on maximum cylinders at the moment because they haven't lost anybody Armstrong's team US Postal Service have been seriously hit they lost one of the big powerhouses Christian Valneveld in a crash with a broken arm and since the start of the tour we've seen a lot of problems for Tyler Hamilton he too crashed on the stage to Antwerp and he's had serious problems with his with his wrist and his arm and elbow and in fact the team time trial caused that injury to flare up again and it's believed that he's got a serious tendonitis in that arm and they've even gone uh, in through the crashing stakes again today. Stefan Yagard uh, crashed on the uh, before we got to the Col de la Madeleine, and he's riding along in a rear group with only one half of his shorts left, and it looks rather painful. Right on the wheel there of Jan Ulrich, there's a white jersey, and that's Vladimiro Belli of Fasa Bortolo. Also very much to the front of this group, riding very well today, is a man by the name of Michael Bogard. And in previous Tour de France, this was always regarded as a little Holland. There are so many Dutch supporters who come out to see this bike race, and they believe that Alpe d'Huez is a small part of their own royalty. 
and uh, we may well see Bogard looking for the victory today because he's a great bike rider and right now he seems to be in excellent form although in previous tours of France he's always had a hard time getting over the big high mountains but just before we came on air today we were chatting with Henny Kuiper who's arrived here the Dutchman who's twice won at Alpe d'Huez and twice finished second in the Tour de France and he simply said Bogart today he's the man to watch out for he says he's got great form you know and this is the first time he's come to the Tour in such good condition and this year he's finished second in the Tour of Valencia third in the uh, Tirano Adriatico and he won the Catalan week which is a pretty tough race uh, in Spain so he has the form and he might be the man to watch well, he's a clever rider, and because of the fact that Jan Ulrich and Armstrong and Morrow will be watching each other, that will be a big chance for Boga to leap off the front and try and get himself the stage victory here. And they would go absolutely crazy if he was able to do that. Bogard is fairly well down in the standings too. He's 31st, around about 36 minutes, 13 seconds off Stuart O'Grady. But O'Grady has completely disappeared. Now, this is rather strange because Laurent Rooks has accelerated somewhat here on the climb, and Jimenez is not able to follow as you say it is a bit of a shock this but uh, obviously this man is going to go for gold today and he could be pulling on the polka dot jersey as king of the mountains tonight after the first major day in the mountains in which we will have climbed three all category climbs which means they are the toughest climbs in the tour and uh, that would be a great coup for the frenchman to say the least uh, but i'm not so sure he's got rid of jimenez yet he's kept his rhythm here Jimenez will ride at his own tempo, he won't panic because of this acceleration right now as the man in front, Laurent Rooks, accelerates, he would love to get maximum points over the top of this mountain and get himself the polka dot jersey, there'll be a big fight behind because Laurent Jalabert also seems very attentive and looks to me as if he wants to take the lead in that competition. Laurent Rooks is now forcing a lone attack off the front of the main field. The main field, Phil, is still more than seven minutes behind and all of the work on the front is being done by Team Telecom. And I think they're trying to set up a big assault on the slopes of the Alpe d'Huez for Jan Ulrich. Looking back down the field there, you can see that's about 100 metres advantage for the Frenchman over the Spaniard. And, and an attack here going from Onse, and they've got the guard cards here because Onse are the riders, could be Sastre who's going now, because these are the riders we would expect to attack. This is either Carlos Sastre or Marcus Serrano who's made a move, and he's keeping their best card, Yoshima Bolocchi, for later as they start now. These are the start of the attacks. They're coming a bit early, Paul. Well, everybody knows and has seen Lance Armstrong riding at the back of this group and they will realise that he's under pressure. They want to hit him as hard as possible. This looks like Bilocki to me, who's actually gone off the front at the moment, and that would be a surprise move. Team Telecom at the moment, though, they're just sitting there quite comfortably, leaving him 30 or 40 yards off the front of the group. Well, if it is Bilocki, this is amazing because this is a card that the, the big stars wouldn't have been thinking of. And if Lance Armstrong is having a spot of trouble, then he is in it right now. I would have expected Sastra to launch an attack at this point. He's got good form and will be a perfect card uh, for Bolocchi to play. The Onse rider hasn't opened up much of an advantage, though. It's only 50 metres and it's still Team Telecom quite content to leave him there. He's not opening up very much of a gap at all. He may well be trying to set it up for an attack to come from another rider from Onse. And you can see Telecom... A very well-drilled squad, they're just picking up the pace slowly there to try and pull this man back into the main field. No panic at all in the telecom squad, it's Andres Cloden coming to the front here, lifting the pace slowly, he doesn't want to put Jan Ulrich into difficulty. Well, the attack has failed, and uh, they're coming back together, this is Steve Vermeau chucking off the bottle there, no spectators to pick it up either, sitting at the back, he yo-yoed on the Madeleine, and he's going to yo-yo on the Glandon now, and the rider with him looks as though it's Laurent Brochard. I expected better from him. He's usually a pretty good climber. Well, that attack has come to nothing. It was a good move by the Onse riders, but you can see that they haven't got any gap off the front at all. The whole of this group is being completely controlled by Telecom right now, but doing the absolute perfect job. Andreas Clouden and Kevin Livingstone, the two strong men for Jan Ulrich, are back in control at the head here as, as still Laurent Brochard is losing ground at the back. And it's quite a long way still to climb here to the top of the Glandon. If you don't hold these riders in your sights, you're not going to catch them on the descent. Benito also in a little spot of bother now at the back. For Bonjour, Steve Vermeau is the other rider. They have been dropped as we move steadily on, the colours of the Italians on the support group there. 
And another little problem here too now because this rider also for Team Bonjour, Gilles Bouvard, is dropping back as well. A lot more riders will get dropped before we get to the summit of this climb because Telecom have come out today with one thought in mind to blow this rate to absolute smithereens. They want to explode it all over the slopes of the Alps and put their men nearer to the front because they were a little disgruntled, I think, by the fact that 14-man group got 34 minutes advantage a couple of days ago and they want to restore the top of the leaderboard at the Tour de France to the way it should have been looking after 10 days of racing right now. But I'd like to stay at the back of this group for a few more kilometers just to see what is happening with Lance Armstrong. This is Towler. He was the man who was in that early break after six kilometers. He's going out of the back of the group. He was caught just a few kilometers ago, and for him, it will be a long survival ride to the finish line. Oh, I wouldn't like to be him now. His legs must be killing him. He's got to get to the top of the Glandon and, of course, to the top of Alt Duez to finish the day after that very early attack. Still, Telecom doing the pacemaking. They're certainly winning the psychological race today, frightening the rest of the riders with this terrific show of pace team car coming up and going forward i think for the moment as we pan across the group pretty went behind the trees there there's nothing we can do about that this is the beauty of the alps i know many people watch the television pictures not because of the tour de france but because of the beauty of france and indeed many of you i know plan your holidays uh, by the way the tour de france goes well be advised don't choose the same week as the tour de france because these roads are totally closed for the passage of the event uh, but it's a great sight and a wonderful atmosphere especially from the crowds along the way because they not only know about the tour they know about how to enjoy themselves as well well, Laurent Roux is just trying to survive over the summit of this climb. He still has around about seven minutes over the main field, and he's looking at just over 57 kilometres to go to the finishing line. You can see that, fortunately for the moment, the clouds are holding high, and if it does rain over the summit of this climb, it would be very cold in, in, the, in the ride in the race. This man right now, Bocharov, is around about six and a half minutes behind the two leaders, but in fact he's only just in front of the main field. You can see them there with the pink train, all over the front of that pack. Yes, but Charloff here is uh, on a ride to nowhere, just concentrating. As Alexander Botcharov here is about to be picked up again, if he looks over his shoulder, he'll see that the field are right behind him. Four or five riders have been dropped now, confirmed. Lon Brochard, Gilles Bouvard, Steve Vermeau, Walter Beneteau, uh, they've been left by this group. There is Laurent Jalabert looking very, very good to the right with the red flashes on his shoulder. David Echeverria is the man in the all orange strip. And Bogart in that other orange strip near his camera without a hat on. He's became, beginning to, uh, uh, we begin to fancy him as a likely man to win the stage today because he's on good form. Uh, we haven't seen Lance Armstrong riding, um, Armstrong riding anywhere near the front of this group all day. There's no doubt he's having a rough ride but he's a great champion, and he's still in the group that matters. He's still in the group containing all of the heads of state of this year's Tour de France, and still, for the moment, the man who is 20 minutes ahead of everybody else in the bike race, Francois Simon, is surviving. He's still remaining in the group, and what a great day that would be for him and the Simon family. His brother, Pascal, wore the yellow jersey back in 1983 and won a stage. All the other brothers, and I raced with two of them on the same team, Jérôme Simon and Régis Simon, they got two stage wins at the Tour de France under their belt. And Francois, the youngest of them all, although he's never won a stage at the Tour de France, would be right up there amongst them if he was able to get the yellow jersey today. And the way he's riding, that looks very much on the cards. It certainly does. Uh, Stuart O'Grady, the erstwhile leader, is now way in the distance. He may not even have started climbing the Glandon yet, but I suspect that the group has by now. As the leader here, heading up towards the summit on his own, Laurent Roux. He gets maximum points on another all-category climb, and that's going to give him a big lead in the King of the Mountains uh, competition. He won the last one over the Madeleine, and he's going to go for his hat-trick today. He's going to try and keep them all at bay right to the top of Alpe d'Huez. And he certainly is on a strong man's ride. He is riding simply superbly, uh, Laurent Roux, today. He's not uh, a huge winner in the world of cycling, but he does uh, choose his victories well. He was the leader this year of the Dauphiné, big stage race in France just before this. As we now drop back to a Rabobank rider here, Dembaka, former champion of Holland, has now said enough is enough, and he too is sliding off the back. 
of the principal peloton of Jan Ulrich and Lance Armstrong, and we must say to Belocchi and Morel. The top four finishers in the Tour de France last year are still in this group right now. Another rider being dropped is Grisha Neerman of Rabobank. The pressure is starting to come to this group right now, Phil. It is very difficult. The two Rabobank riders are getting popped off the back right now. This man is insisting and hoping to open up an advantage, but the main field are right behind him, and they'll very shortly be right on his tails. The man doing a great job for Telecom today is that man on the front there, Andreas Cloden, a magnificent bike rider. And Ulrich has got a man to take over the pacemaking if Andreas Cloden should fail, and that's Kevin Livingstone. At the back of this group, insistently and all of the time, we're seeing the man who wears number one as the winner of last year's event and the winner of the 1999 Tour de France as well. Lance Armstrong is really having a tough day today, but he may be able to ride himself in. It's a very strange thing, the sport of cycling, having ridden for 10 days on the flat races with lots of big gear work and then all of a sudden being forced to go uphill and using a small gear. Quick glimpse there at the back of the group. I saw Armstrong again. This is what it looks like at the back end of the group. It is not fun to be here right now. You're just hoping that the group will ease, but they never do. And you lose five metres, ten metres, then all of a sudden it's minutes. Chavanel is going for Bonjour now. I think that only leaves uh, the one rider up there now, Francois Simon. Gutierrez is also struggling. What a cruel event cycle racing is when you see it like this. These are the proudest, best bike riders in the world trying to match equal opportunities. And there we have now the man who is in a spot of bother. And he's got to keep on thinking, I am the leader of this tour. I mustn't let them ride away because Francois Simon is suffering today, my goodness me. It hurts. He's got a big mission today to try and get himself that yellow jersey. He's not a great climber. He's actually more reputed as a sprinter. But today he's probably given the one chance that you get in a whole career, and that is the chance to get himself the yellow jersey, and he can't hold the group. He wants to hold the group. He's digging deep, but once it starts to go, you will just absolutely blow your mind he's done it though Phil he's actually managed to pick up the tail end of the Rampre rider just in front of him but that Lamprey rider is also having a very difficult time too they're all trying to survive as we get to the summit of this climb I have a feeling that this little man at the back Francois Simon from France is going to get dropped behind but he could do it on the descent we're looking now at Francois Simon just dangling at the back of the principal peloton here in the Tour de France. Only two riders ahead now. It says, of course, here he's second, which he was this morning, but he's actually the leader of the Tour. Stuart O'Grady is many minutes behind now. The race radio no longer talking about the Mayo Jaune. We're looking at the new one, but he's got to hang on to this group. He's got plenty of time in hand over the principals after that long breakaway. This could be his greatest day. In fact, his nearest man to him is in the group ahead of him, is Kivalev, and he's 17 and a half minutes behind the rider we've just seen. Now, Belocchi is half an hour behind. He's best of the rest. So he's got to hold this group as long as possible as we look right through the valley from the Col de Glandon. And in the distance with the snow on the top is Alp Duez. And that's where we'll finish today, just below that snow line. And we go back to the leader now. Simply a magnificent ride here by Laurent Roux. You mustn't write this man off. Here's a man who won the Amateur Tour de France as it was in 1997. He also finished third in that race, the Tour de l'Avenir. So he is a good bike rider. And if he's found his old form, then he's going to give everybody a spot of bother. But to put it into perspective, I don't think he's going to win the Tour de France this year because at the start of the day, he was 94th overall, an hour behind the leader, Stuart O'Grady. So that puts him half an hour behind all of the other favourites. The climb the riders are attacking right now is the Col de Glandon. Now, if you climb the Col de Glandon from the other side, it's actually the Col de la Croix de Fer. And then when it meets the same road at the top of the descent into the Valley of Oison. They'll then face 15 kilometres of flat, Oh, and it hurts for this man here. 169 from the Bonjour team of France. Francois Simon, the youngest of the four Simon brothers, is hanging on for grim death. He wants to hold on to the yellow jersey. He knows it's a great chance, and he's going to ride at every opportunity closer to the front. But he's really now in serious danger. Well, he's, he's not going to give up. He's past Marco Pinotti there, the Italian on the Lamprey team and quickly hooked up to the wheel of Alexander Vinukurov, who's now come to the back, but he's still hanging on after his magnificent pace-making at the start of this climb. Pinotti wants a little bit of help. Well, I don't think anybody can give him that, but his team will come up and have a word with him, I'm sure. 
probably wants a drink because his bottle cage is on his bike that are both empty well hats off to little uh, Francois Simon here he had a bad patch for a few moments I thought he cracked but he's dug deep and he's back up with the lead leaders the actual leader is not far away from the last kilometer of the climb well, that's a great uh, piece of courage there coming from that man there is Armstrong not looking good his sunglasses on the top of his head all over his machine right now and it's so amazing to see Armstrong close to the back of this group when a man like Francois Simon is digging into all kinds of courage to try and stay in contact with the group this is the leader Laurent Rooks he will hope that he keeps a certain amount of advantage over the summit of this climb his gap over the main peloton of favorites including Ulrich Armstrong and Moreau right now is six minutes and 25 and on this climb Phil he's hardly lost any time at all only one and a half minutes to the big challenges his best tour this is his fourth came in 1997 that was one of his great years when he finished 23rd he didn't make it in 98 and he hasn't ridden since 1998 either uh, this is his first tour since then and he's riding extremely well 21 wins to his career he turned pro in 1994. He's driving on now with his zipper undone on his racing jersey, looking for maximum points on the Col de Glandon. And just look at the determination there of this man's face. So the order on the course at the moment, Rue leads uh, Jimenez by 50 seconds, and the peloton containing Ulrich by 6 minutes and 25. Well, he's now looking towards the summit here. He looks right up into the distance and will know that once he gets there, he will get respite for 15 kilometers at least because he will plunge off the top of the Col de Glandon down into the small town of Alamond, which will then give him the 15 kilometer ride along the flat valley of Oison to the town of Bourgoison, which every bike rider in the world knows hosts the finish of the most unbelievable climb, the historic climb. And it's difficult now for Simon Phil. Simon has cracked at ah. the back. He's not able to do it anymore. He's pushed himself beyond and above his limits to stay in with the group. He wants the yellow jersey, but it's now slipping away from him. Well, he still can afford uh, to lose time. He can lose more than a quarter of an hour and still get yellow tonight. But that will have closed up the Tour de France general classification for sure. He's just got to this part of the Glandon, which is just that little bit steeper. You saw when he came round that corner there how that road kicked up and that, that hurt him. Now, it will level again in a second or two and he might get back because the leader is virtually on the summit. It's not so far to go for this man. He's probably got to suffer for 10 more minutes and and he'll be over the top and he, if he can just keep them in his sights he will get back on the valley road what he has to do right now is not panic find his own rhythm not lose too much time on the final kilometers of this Col de Glandon and then take huge risks on the descent and he should be able to do that because he's a very good sprinter you can see the red white and blue bands on his shirt collar there that indicates he was a former champion of France that was last year the title this year going across to his teammate Didier Roos who has been riding exceptionally so far but he doesn't have any teammates left in this group to help him out at all all he can do Phil is ride a slow and steady pace and try and make sure he doesn't lose too much time 17 minutes is his advantage over the second man in the bike race at the moment and that's Andre Kivalev yes Kivalev could be the next leader but that might be tomorrow or even sometime in the Pyrenees this is such an interesting Tour de France we keep talking about race leaders we don't believe any of them will win the Tour de France because we still think uh, the principal favorites remain such especially now after today's performance I think Jan Ulrich has assumed the top position of race favorite for this year's tour we'll see there's the beauty of the Tour de France and the valley of the Oison as we look down the valley here we're almost at the top of the Col de Glandon with the leader of the tour on the road by just on six minutes now he's going to be a clear leader in the king of the mountains Laurent Roux has refound the form of about seven years ago when he was thought to be one of the top up-and-coming bike riders in France he's climbing steadily now to the top of the Glandon while poor old Francois Simon has just been dropped by the main field he's got to try and hang on there for a little bit longer because he knows what it's all about in the Tour de France for Simon it's his ninth tour he knows what to be expected from the riders but he's never been in such a position before where he could in fact take the race lead this is the rider approximately one minute be behind this is the Bonesta rider Eladio Jimenez a last time check we got he was 50 seconds behind so he's still well clear and riding second place on the mountain 
Uh, I don't think he recover in time to get back up to the leader. Now, just uh, popping in and out the top of our picture frame there, you can see the crowd. It's still confirmed at 50 seconds. There they are. They're heading up now to almost the top. It zigzags like a giant Z uh, there, and that will take them up. For the first time, we've got some idea too, Paul, of the strong winds in the Alps. There's no wind at all at Alduez, which is only across the valley, but it looks pretty strong there. Very difficult. What will happen to these riders is uncertain of these straightaways. They'll get a tailwind, then they'll turn around the hairpin bend, and at the far end, they'll get a block headwind, and that will make it very difficult to keep the pace high. This man at the moment is really digging deep. He's suffering an awful lot to just keep that pedal ticking over. He's probably at the, the largest sprocket that he's got on that cluster at the back there just hoping that he will survive over the summit of this climb if he can get maximum points then at the end of the day he will have a very good thing success in fact he will have had the jersey for the king of the mountains put onto his shoulders but it's still an awful long way to go and when you attack after six kilometers you'd use an awful lot of energy on a big breakaway like this well the crowd uh, applauding whatever nationality they are it does not matter they're applauding the rider's feet are conquering a major alpine pass. And the ibernesto.com rider here is indeed Eladio Jimenez, a young pro bike rider who is now riding the tour for the very first time. He must be wondering what's hit him here because he is Spanish and he can climb, but these climbs are so, so difficult. There's the principal group containing the four top riders in last year's Tour de France. The one who doesn't seem to be riding well, we have to say, is Lance Armstrong. But so what? At the moment, he's in that group. And as every bike rider will tell you, tomorrow is another day and the body is a very strange thing. Kevin Livingstone, who rode a brilliant tour for Lance when he won the past two years, has switched camps. He's now riding a brilliant tour for Jan Ulrich. Meanwhile, this is Francois Simon, who is the leader of this race on the road after that long escape. But he is dangling now just off the back. And the race referee is keeping all of the cars behind so he can't use those vehicles to get back to that lead group. He may well just survive right now. If we can have a look up the road, we'll see how far in front, but that's unfortunate for him. It's an empty road. There's nobody there. There's nobody to, to use to try and pace himself up to. And right now, he must be losing around about 30 or 40 seconds on that group. There's the tail end of the leaders. We move forward now to the group containing Jan Ulrich, Lance Armstrong and the rest. Christophe Moreau, the Frenchman, is there as well. Still the sun shines on the Glandon, but not for Francois Simon at the moment. Mutual service is here. A couple of team cars have been allowed through. Credit Agricole was one of them. This is Benesto, I think. And he might want to get right through the peloton and up to Eladio uh, Jimenez, because he's the man he wants to speak to. There's obviously a problem here for Armstrong, because moving forward, the team car of Johan ah. Brunil comes up alongside Rubiera taking on board drinks now this is actually not permitted on the slopes of the climbs normally you're not supposed to take a drink as you climb we see him taking drinks on board there and that will be for Armstrong and Armstrong is obviously drinking an awful lot of liquid today Ulrich in third position there Jalabert in fourth belly moving forward Vinukarov is bringing drinks up to the rest of the group as we look further down there is Gardzelli Michael Bogard is there Kivilev Cuesta Jonathan Vort is in the green and white. That was the Roberto Heras. There's Axel Merckx. It's a long way back down this group to see Lance Armstrong. There he is. He doesn't look good, Phil. He should not be riding so far down the group. He's obviously having a very hard day. He looked as though he's blowing his nose. But you know, Paul, I still haven't seen Heras. And we've had no word on him. You saw him? I saw him there. He's got a uh, bandage on his knee. He was riding halfway down the group and uh, not really very prominent in the front 15 riders in this group right now. It's the turn of Livingston to set the pace on the front of the group, and what a strange situation that must be for Lance Armstrong right now. There's Armstrong throwing away one more drink. Heras doing the job of keeping him topped up with as much energy as possible, but I'm absolutely convinced right now that he's not having a great day, but he could ride himself back in on the Valley Road. The first mountain stage is always very strange for the body. What can happen is you suffer having used monstrous gears over the flat. Armstrong came into the Tour in absolutely superb condition, but his approach to the Tour de France was very different to that of previous years. He rode the Tour of Switzerland, which he won, and that was only 10 days before the Tour started. He may well have peaked just a little bit too soon. Well, there he is, Lance Armstrong, riding his own private Tour de France at the moment, talking to no one and concentrating. 
as he just continues up the climb. The Benesta rider going past him there. Uh, no, it's not the best of riders, it's a happy rider, Stefano Garcelli, and it was Audrey Zola, I think, or, or uh, one of the other riders it was. It was Menchov, I think, who went through there as well. Steady climbing towards the summit of the Col de Glandom. We're waiting for the leader, who is almost there. He may well have gone over, uh, but we haven't had any word on that situation. Our camera's staying with what they see as the Battle of the Tour de France. Oh, there we are. One kilometre to the summit then. Uh, of climbing left on the Col de Glandon. You see by the speed now of uh, Rue here just how steep the final kilometres of the Col de Glandon really is. This is such a tough haul now. It's very difficult. The speed that this man is going right now is probably around about 12 miles an hour. And for the first 10 days of the Tour de France, we've been racing at speeds approaching 27 miles an hour. So it's a huge change for these riders' bodies and for their muscles as well. This man really is suffering to keep this gear ticking over. But in fact, he's doing an excellent job and conserving an awful lot of his time gap over the main field. Second man on the road, this is Jimenez. He's a minute 15 down. And this is the second rider on the course, uh, Eladio Jimenez. Started the day 68 minutes behind Stuart O'Grady, the race leader. Now he's riding the mountain, a minute and 15 behind the race leader today, Laurent Roux. And the peloton, that first big group with the principal favourites, is now at six minutes. They're hardly closing in quickly, Paul. They're making a big meal of it, in fact. Very difficult. It just goes to show that this man is doing an excellent job. He's conserving the majority of his advantage over the main field. He had eight and a half minutes advantage at the bottom of this climb, which is a 20 kilometre climb, and he's still holding on to six minutes of those. So he will now go into the valley section before the Altuez with around about five minutes advantage over the main field. He could be setting himself up for a victory here on the slopes of the Altuez, but I think one man would like to take that away from him, and he's in third place at the front end of that main field right now. That is Jan Ulrich. He is planning something very big today. Maybe thinking back to the big climb up to Arcalis back in the Tour de France that he won, which is there he laid the foundations for his victory, and that was a very tough uphill finish as well. Jimenez, he's suffering in second position on the road, a minute 15, but both of these riders still are surviving off the front end of the main pack, which contains Armstrong, Bilocchi, Moro, Ulrich, all of the big names. But for the moment, we still believe that Armstrong is having a serious amount of difficulty. He's got two teammates in the group with him, Heras and Rubiera, but not once have they been anywhere near the first 10 riders in the field. And uh, we believe there are 25 riders, more or less, in that peloton containing Armstrong and the principals. As now the leader of the Tour de France today, the Frenchman at that, is climbing up towards the finish of the Col de Glandon. Then he plunges to the valley below and lines up as he goes to the beautiful little town of bourg Blazon. He starts to climb the Alp itself, which will bring him up to us on the finishing line. Just look at the crowd here now, the French flag's flying high, so to the Italian flag up there on the right. Uh, this rider now being cheered all of the way as he's conquered the Col de la Madeleine, he's about to conquer the Col de Glandon. A wonderful day out because he broke away at six kilometres today, he's rid himself of Antonio Taula earlier, now he's rid himself on this climb of Eladio Jimenez, who will hang on to cross this mountain in second place, which should confirm him lying second overall in the King of the Mountains while the principal players are still shadow boxing behind, but that will not be the case on Alp Duez. They are going to tear each other to shreds, and there's no doubt about that now. There'll be some sore bodies on the slopes of Alp Duez because this has been a very long, hard stage today. 209 kilometres in total, and they started climbing after 87 kilometres of the bike race. That was with the first climb of the day, the Col de la Madeleine. They then plunged down into the valley in the town of saint Etienne de Queen, and then they began the long, large ascent up to the Col de Glandon, which is where we're coming to right now. And it has been a very long and hard climb in the main field. A lot of the work has been done by Team Telecom on the front trying to set something up for their man, Jan Ulrich, who I think in the back of his mind today seriously wants to try and get himself the win because he could probably read the signs that Lance Armstrong is not great. But that is maximum points over the summit of the second all-category climb of the Tour de France this year, the Col de Glandon for Laurent Rousse. So he will, at the end of today, be the new leader at the top of the King of the Mountains competition. And Eladio Jimenez is not too far from crossing that summit either. He is approximately a minute and 15 
15 seconds behind and the main field are not making any impression on the advantage of these leaders. But this is going to be a real ascent of the Alpe d'Huez today because every rider in this group is absolutely screaming out in agony. Jimenez approaching the summit right now, a minute back. And this is Eladio Jimenez who is now about to arrive at the summit. Rue has done that and he starts the journey down again. What a cruel day it is in the Tour de France after nine days, well actually including the prologue, ten days of racing. The Tour de France is now in the mountains. The Alpe d'Huez is the next climb. The Shrine of Cycling, which is packed with tens of thousands of spectators. If you think the crowd is big here, wait till you see the last five kilometres today of Alpe d'Huez. I've never seen so many people on the mountain in their camper vehicles and tents, and it was pretty chilly on the mountain last night. It went down to round about, I suppose, Paul, as six or seven degrees Celsius. Very cold at the top of the mountain. It's been very cold over the summits of these mountains throughout the stage as well, although it has warmed up to around about 20 degrees Celsius along the valley roads as Eladio Jimenez is absolutely in agony right now, just trying to get over the last kilometre of this climb. They will then face a certain amount of respite because as he approached the summit here, they will face then around about 25 kilometres descending down into the town of Alamont, and that is right in the bottom of the valley which heads up to Bourg d'Oison. Second on the big climb for this man, Eladio Jimenez, but the descent, Phil, unfortunately, is not a great descent. There are a couple of false flats in it, which will hurt the rider's legs. Here we are now, back with this principal peloton. Two riders over the top. This is the race for third place. Watch out for Jalabur in that red top, just tucked off to the right of our picture. He's anxious to become a leader of the Tour in the Mountains, which many people said, impossible, this man can't climb like that. Well, he is climbing the high mountains with great success. Behind him is Stefano Garcelli, Christophe Moreau off to the right. The man who won the shortest stage of the Tour at Dunkirk a week last Saturday when he was first in the prologue time trial and held the lead for two days. Now he's showing us he can climb mountains as well. And it is in this region, really, where we should also be seeing the face of the American Lance Armstrong. But he has been sent to the back of the car today and he's just going to have to hang on down there as best he can. Ulrich looking over at his teammate there, Andreas Cloden, doing a magnificent job. And I think Kevin Livingston has absolutely cracked. He's done his job for Team Telecom, and the speed that he's going indicates he's not going back to the team car at all. Well, this, I suppose, in some ways was to be expected. Kevin has given every ounce of strength as he's climbed the two mountains as first or second man with some fine pacemaking at that. But just as he's coming to the top of the climb, he is taking a bottle and a little bit of help there, but we won't be looking as he now heads up to the summit. Paul, because of where he's being dropped, he's going to come back on the descent. He'll take them to the Alp at least. Well, if they slow down on the descent, he could ride himself back into this. But Kevin Livingston today just proving what a domestique and a super domestique is all about. You ride your heart out for your leader, and in this case, the leader is number 11 there. And Kevin seems to have found a second life here. He's still in contact with the cars. If he doesn't lose more than a minute over the summit of this climb, he could ride himself back into the group for the final climb of the day, Alpe d'Huez. 21 there. And the pink jersey is Joseba Bilocchi. The most aggressive bike rider in the race wears the red number there, 131. That is Laurent Jalabert. Stefano Garzelli is in this group. Christophe Moreau is in this group, 31. The blue jersey there with Festina. There is the leader of Rabobank, 51, Michael Bogard. They are all in this group at the moment. This is the front end. 44 there is Vladimir Obelli. But at the back of this group, we have three riders from US Postal. Lance Armstrong, Jose, Jose Luis Ribeira and Roberto Heras. Armstrong is having a horrendous day. So a bike race that seemed to project one man as the outstanding favourite and nobody else in with a chance. Here we're looking at a very select group of men now. Any one of them could win the Tour de France at this sort of level. Andreas Cloden is coming up now. We've already got over the top Laurent Roux. 1 minute 58 behind has gone Jimenez. Now we're waiting for a sprint for third place. Godzelli, who took on uh, Jalabert last time, is going to probably take him on again now. Jalabert gets a bit twitchy in the red. He wants the King of the Mountains points to stay in that competition right up amongst the leaders. But the pacemaking still being done by Andreas Cloden. 
Ulrich, his face a picture of poker, has done nothing at all but sit there. He hasn't shown us any effort at all as he comes up towards the summit. He is going to release all of his anger on Al Duez. I'm sure of that now. It's a question of whether Lance Armstrong can go with him. Well, Ulrich has come out here and used his team up one by one. He now only has one man left in this group, and that one man left in this group is Andreas Cloden. He needs to pay them back for the work. Acceleration from Jalabert. Jalabert wants to go over the top of this climb in third place. This is going to be the best Tour de France Jalabert has ever had. Stefano Garzelli is on his wheel. Up to the line for Jalabert. It's going to be third place. Great points. Five minutes, 48 seconds in arrears. Next man across the line was Stefano Garzelli, and here is Livingstone. He's hoping that he can stay within 30 or 40 seconds, and he'll go down this mountain like a man possessed to stay in contact. When you're a domestique, you will dig so deep for your leader, and that's what Kevin Livingstone is going to do next. 5.48 as Jalabert went over the top. Garzelli chased him over, as he did on the Col de, Madeleine, de la Madeleine. Now they're starting the long descent, and uh, I think it won't be too big a problem for Kevin Livingstone to get back as he comes up towards the summit of the climb at 6.27. He is looking now at less than a minute, and on the descent, that should be handleable because simply they will not race down the mountain. They will just go down at a reasonable speed. As we look here at the situation, 40 points for Roux, 35 for Jimenez, 30 for Jalabert, as it was on the previous climb. Uh, but Laurent Roux is now the leader clear on his own of the King of the Mountains in the Tour de France today. And he's still out in front by almost six minutes over this main chase. Well, this and now, Phil, is a 26-kilometre descent. This is the little professional foul that Kevin Livingstone is taking. He's taking on board a hat at the moment. It's something that is somewhat supported by the referees as long as they don't see it. But if they do, Kevin Livingstone might find himself with a little 10-second penalty and probably a 50 Swiss franc fine. But if it keeps you in the bike race, then it's certainly well, well worthwhile. This is the descent off the Col de la Glandon and the Col de la Croix de Fer, and it is one of the most beautiful descents I know of in the Alps. A magnificent dam on the left-hand side that this man who's racing towards a possible victory at Alpe d'Huez at the moment, Laurent Roux, is absolutely having no time at all to appreciate. His advantage over the second man in the race is around 1 minute 30 seconds now and 5 minutes 48 seconds to the main field. Simon is 2 minutes behind the group of Jan Ulrich and Lance Armstrong at the moment, so he's keeping himself in a chance with getting that yellow jersey tonight, but he's still, Phil, got a very long ride to the summit of the Alpe d'Huez tonight. I think he'll give himself a big shot and try to race back in the valley here and then lose just enough time on the mountain. He can afford to lose 17 minutes on the mountain at the finish and still be the race leader tonight, you know, and to lead just for one day would be a tremendous achievement for uh, the nine times tour rider Francois Simon. This is the rider who's still second on the road. Last time check was a minute 58 briefly, it was Jimenez. Now looking at the principal peloton of 25 riders as they charge down the valley and past that beautiful lake here in the valley of the Oison. We'll get down to the main road and race along the valley road itself then, which is the main route nationale. Uh, between uh, Besançon and Grenoble, and then we'll turn left and climb the Alp itself. Marcus Serrano sitting here at the back, and uh, there are three Onse riders, as far as we know, in this breakaway. Well, Onse are a very challenging team for the ascent of Alpe d'Huez today. Marcus Serrano may well be the man to leap out of the pack and cause that surprise. This man is another of the Kelme riders who was caught in the transfers during the winter months, and he really did blow that Kelme team apart. All of the top riders were taken from Kelme. Two of them now ride for US Postal Service. And this is the moment that Kevin Livingstone will be dreaming of. With that group switching across the road like that, Livingstone should reintegrate the lead. The riders taking a well-deserved breather here. This is a good news for Kevin Livingstone because they've turned off here as they've started to look around for capes and for drinking bottles, a little extra food, and of course uh, the Telecom boys in control have slowed the pace down to allow Kevin to come back to the race. It's also going to do Francois Simon a good piece of luck here. He's gone over the top just under two minutes behind uh, this group, and he could come back as well. 
Well, this is going to be very important for the riders in Team Telecom because they, a few moments ago, looked as if they'd lost nearly all of the teammates. Vinokurov has made a very rapid descent to come back to the front of this group. Andreas Cloden is in there, and I would think in a few moments' time we'll see the return of Kevin Livingstone. There is still an awful long way to the summit of Alp d'Huez. We crossed the top of the Col de la Glandon after 156 kilometres of climbing, and that leaves these riders around about 50 kilometres from the finish line. 25 kilometres of that is going to be downhill off this Col de Glandon, and then they face around about 15 kilometres of climbing on the flat. This is a chance to get a look at the two leaders on the road at the moment. On the left-hand side is Laurent Roux. He's now two minutes ahead of Eladio Jimenez and around five minutes and 48 seconds ahead of the main field. But the next time check we will get, it will be up much closer to the seven-minute mark because the main group there now, I think, are taking a breather before the final assault of the day.